I'm going to be taking a look at a network switch from a company which I want to pronounce as Zykestore, but I decided to ask them how do you pronounce your company name, and I thought maybe it could be like Zeke Store or something like that, but they said Seeker Store. I didn't expect that because there's no R in the first half of the uh, name, uh, so I, I wasn't expecting it to be Seeker Store, but I think they wanted to register the name that was spelled more closely to how it was pronounced, but they weren't able to for whatever reason. They just settled on the way it's currently spelled, but I'm going to be referring to the switch as Seeker Store. So you'll see like on the network switch itself, it has a logo that says Seeker, so you can see there where that's part of the name, even though it's not spelled like that. But that was kind of interesting. Full disclosure, Seeker Store sent me this network switch to take a look at, but the opinions in the video are, are my own. And the only thing they wanted me to tell you was how to actually access the web interface to help users out. So in this video, I'm going to show off this switch. And it has one of those awfully long names, SKS7300. 8GPY4XGS. So this has eight 2.5 gigabit Ethernet interfaces and four SFP plus 10 gigabit Ethernet interfaces. And then you also have a console port here. So this is like a usually higher end switches and ones that have more features and functionality will have a command line interface that you can access to the console if you don't want to access the web interface. So Seeker Store offered me a couple of different options to look at whether they had a couple of the six port models and then they had this 12 port model as an option. I decided to go with the bigger model because I wanted to see if I had more advanced networking features, and you can tell right away it already has a console port, which means it has a command line interface. So I wanted to kind of see what that looked like. And the, also the 12 port model, as you can see, I put the rack ears on it, is rack mountable. So that's very cool. I, I wanted to see how good of an option this could be if you're looking for a super budget friendly 2.5 to 10 gig network switch that has more than six ports so this is like the next size up essentially you could you could get like an eight port model but usually you only get like one sfp plus sometimes sometimes you might get two so this is about the next size up that you would want to go to that's still in a you know pretty budget friendly price range this currently is usually about 249 us dollars which is not too bad i seen it on sale with a 50 dollar off coupon when i first was looking into this product at the time of this video it might be forty dollars so but if you look for those types of sales you can get this network switch for closer to two hundred dollars which makes it even better to go and they do make a poe version of this i was kind of wanting to get one of those to see if they they had a poe version they didn't have any in stock for review units i personally think these type of network switches which have 2.5 gig and 10 gig interfaces on the same network switch are perfect for home lab use for those who want higher speed uh, interfaces at the core of their network without breaking the bank because this is a super budget friendly option compared to like some of the other network switches from other vendors. So this, this network switch comes with a power cord and it comes with a console cable. So it's, it's nice that these network switches come with a console cable, it's USB on one end and it's RJ45 on the other. So it looks like a network cable. And, but you can use that to program the switch. You don't have to go find a cable if you don't have one available. So it makes it nice, especially for home users who might not have extra console cables laying around. Seeker Store wanted me to mention how to access the web interface of this network switch because sometimes people don't know how to access it properly and they think the network switch is broken. I can understand why because of the user manual that comes with it doesn't tell you like much of anything, how to log in and do anything. You have to go to their website and get the user manual off there, which it has. Uh, you know, hundreds of pages of all the details of all the different features. So it's a lot more detailed than what you would expect for a network switch with this, these kinds of features. But on the bottom of this has the username, and password, and the IP address, the default credentials and information on there. So as far as build quality is concerned, this thing has a reasonable amount of weight to it. It's, of course, it's not going to be as heavy as a PoE switch because it has all the power distribution you know, components in it that always makes it heavier. But I've noticed that the uh, rack gears on this I don't know if you can tell in the video, are reasonably thick. They're thicker than my TP-Link switch rack ears. They're, they're probably the thinnest rack ears of all the network equipment that I have. These would like warp or the side wouldn't hold the weight very well and these screws are, you know, they would kind of loosen up over time because you can't handle the weight as well. Uh, and these seem like they would hold up a lot better than the TP-Link rack ears that I have. So I'm pleased that they made this thick enough gauge metal because that's always important. And I noticed on the front, from the pictures, I think because it's maybe a computer rendering, like on Amazon, the front of this looks like completely white. And when in reality, it's like this um, metallic, like silver, which is 
kind of a nicer look than just like a solid white panel because that's one thing i noticed on the website it actually looks better in person than it does on the product images on amazon yeah so pretty much all network switches that have sfp plus cages come with these covers dust covers to keep dirt and stuff from getting in there uh, that's always nice to have those and all the led lights are on one side and you know, some network switches put them underneath each of the ports and stuff. It's kind of nice having it for a smaller switch has less fewer ports on it. It is kind of nice having the LEDs on one side because, you know, the cables won't block the LED lights because sometimes you have to look in between the cables if you have this like fully populated or mostly populated to see like what is the status of these LEDs. And for this network switch, if it's green LED, it means you have a 2.5 gig connection and if you have one gig or less, it's yellow. I'll go ahead and show you on the back. It's just a power connection on one side. And then they have a grounding screw. You can, if you ground it, you want to ground it to your server rack. As for power consumption, when nothing is plugged into the switch, it uses 7.89 watts. And when I fully populate the switch, it looks like it's using about 16.87 watts, which is more than double the idle consumption of nothing plugged in. So it, it does increase a decent amount when you plug in all 12 interfaces. So what I'm going to do now is log into the web interface. The IP address to log into the web interface is 192.168.10.12. So I'm going to log in. The default username is admin with a no password. So not super secure. As you can see, when you first log in, it defaults to Chinese. So if you click on this drop down box, you can switch it to English. So that's what we will want to do if you don't speak Chinese. And you'll see a very basic interface here on the front that uh, the front page that has all the ports that are plugged in and it has a little blinking lights to show activity, network activity, and it has some statistics when you mouse over to see how many packets have gone through that port. You can also see the link speed, which is nice. You can see I have two 2.5 gig devices plugged in and both of them are 2.5. And then I have two 10 gig devices plugged in. One of them is another network switch. And the first one is a, another mini PC that has a 10 gig interface. So let's go to switching because this is where probably most of the configuration will be done for what you're going to be using for your home network. So as you see on this ports management page, you can get some information about all the connections. You can see what the link status is, what the speed is, it's detected. And you can also just, you know configure certain things like the maximum frame size. This is where if you want to do jumbo frames, you need to increase this amount. And I recommend only using jumbo frames on an isolated network for like storage purposes. Otherwise it can cause problems. If so the port media type config is a very important page because if you're using SFP plus DAC cables, you might very well need to change this media type to one of these DAC options. And these are just different length cables that you're using. I'm not sure what the length has to do with this, but I also noticed this on my grand streams network switch that they had different length cables you can pick. So if you just pick one, it's the closest to the length you're using like, cause this is like, you know, 0.5 meters, one meter, three meters, five meters. And so you, you could just pick a DAC option and you can see I'm doing that with one of my cables that's connected to my other network switch. But if you don't do this, the cable, the SFU DAC cable will either not work at all or it will work, but you might have issues with speed and in, in, especially in one direction. Uh, that's kind of one thing I kind of noticed, like one direction it was full 10 gig throughput and the other direction was like a few hundred kilobits. It was like really bad. It's like unusable. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on? And I know that there's, I've had a lot of SFP plus compatibility issues in the past, but you can clear up some of those compatibility issues by setting the media type. So this, this is why I'm pausing on this page and emphasizing the importance of be able to set this option. So let's go to the uh, port descriptions. You can, you can give it a name for these ports so you can you know, name what devices are on there. That, I like to use this on my network switches. You know, I have to update them periodically and sometimes I forget <laughs> to do it because it's really nice to be able to log in and be like, hey, what device is on here? And I don't have to go look it up or go over to my network switch and figure it out. So the lag page, you can do basic or LACP lags. Basic lags are just static lags. And most people will probably want to do LACP lags. So you can do the port configuration here and set which you know, lag, what the lag number is here with the, I believe that's the admin key, uh, is the lag number. You can set those things up, you know, on this network switch so that you can make use of, if you want to do multiple ports connected to another network switch or a server or whatever, you could do that. 
Let's see, VLANs. So VLANs are what most people are going to want to configure when they get a switch like this, for even for home network. So you'll see there's a basic page here for VLAN configuration. All this page does is allows you to create new VLAN IDs with a name, like I did here with this lab VLAN. But if I go to the advanced page, I, I notice that the, the first option for this VLAN configuration looks exactly the same. So the basic configuration page the, is also included in the advanced section. So the, you, you still will need this page, even for the advanced options, to set up your, your VLAN IDs that you're going to want to use. But then when you go to set up the VLAN, you can go down to VLAN membership and you'll see the two VLANs that I have set up. The VLAN one is basically the default VLAN, which is not really technically a VLAN, it's like an untagged network, but they always include that as VLAN one in most network switches. So you'll see that I have, uh, for VLAN one, you'll see that I have U in here for untagged, which means these are all VLAN one ports. And when I switch over to 110, you'll see uh, these are not, these are blank, which means they're not part of this VLAN. So only the untagged U ones are part of this VLAN. And the T is tagged, which means this is our trunk port. This is where it's connected to my other network switch. So I can tie it into my rest of my network and pass the VLAN traffic along. I can set up any number of VLANs in here. And as long as I use port 11 as my tag port, I'll be able to pass all that traffic to my other network switches. Uh, so all you have to do to assign, say, port 8 to the 110 network, if I click on untag, untag, you have to click it twice. You notice if I keep clicking, it clears it out. So I click once, twice, and three times. So I want to set it to U for port 8. So I'm going to add port 8 to this VLAN and hit apply. You'll notice if I go back to VLAN 1, it still has this as untagged, so that's kind of interesting. You don't really need it there once you add it to the other VLAN. So just to be sure that it stays on the 110 network, just, we can go ahead and clear that out. So now let's go to the port PVID configuration, because once you set it there, that it has it under, as 110 is access mode VLAN. And it, it says general here, but we could set that to access if you want. We don't have to do that. SCP is useful if you have three or more switches connected together and you have them all connected to each other. So you have loops in your network. This helps prevent that. I usually just avoid loops in my network by just having one main switch that I connect all my other switches to it. So it's kind of like my aggregation switch. So, okay, multicast is IGMP snooping. Some people might want to use that if you have IP cameras to reduce bandwidth on your network. I tend to just isolate my cameras on its own network so it's not that big of a deal to not really have uh, IGMP snooping. I don't have a lot of monitors, camera monitors running, so it's not like I'm wasting a ton of bandwidth by having like 10 different camera monitors. There's a bunch of settings in here. And there might be some VoIP settings in here to, to prioritize VoIP connections. There's a lot, of, a lot of stuff in here, but you can also make use of quality of service controls as well. You want to limit bandwidth between your, your networks and different uh, interfaces on there. And then of course with security, you can tie this in with a radius server. Uh, you can change your local passwords and add admin users with different access to the switch. Most home users, you're not gonna really need that. You just have one access, you know, user accessing it, not that big a deal. Um, but there are some things in here for security, like, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what that's about. Is this giving me a little error there? <laughs> uh, but there's some, you can do HTTPS configuration if you wanna enable HTTPS. You might want to do that so you can log in securely, which is always good, you know, not unencrypted. Uh, SSH is nice if you want to configure it via console. Um, Telnet, this is one option where I you, you should probably disable this. I don't know why Telnet's enabled these kind of devices. It doesn't hurt to disable that because Telnet's not a secure protocol. And then you have console, console port options as well because this has a console port. The smaller network switches do not come with a console port. So that's one nice thing. If you prefer to do command line on your network switch, you can be a little more hardcore with it, right? You don't even need to use the web interface. You can, you can limit access to this web interface with different IP address ranges and stuff like that. So that's good to, um, to know. And then there's a bunch of settings here for denial of service based off like different, um, you know, you always got the sin, you know, port fragment attacks and those kinds of things. DOS, there's a bunch of DOS options in here. <laughs> so that's pretty cool if you want to try to limit this kind of thing at the switch layer two level, that might be a good thing. You can do port based authentication on this network switch. You can do some various monitoring when you click on the monitoring section, you just 
port link statuses. You can do a little cable test. Uh, you can just see the cable links and those sorts of things. And you can do uh, the SIP you know, port information about whatever interfaces are plugged in. For some reason, it doesn't show my any of my interfaces. I have two plugged in right now, so I'm not sure why it's not showing any information, but that's something that could show up on there. Maybe if it can detect the information, it'll show up in there. You know, you got your basic maintenance, which will be, you know, configuration, uh, imports and exports, and upgrades for firmware, and those basic types of things. All right, so that's basically all I wanted to show with this web interface, is to kind of give a quick idea of how to set up, especially VLANs. I hope you found this video about the secret store switch to be interesting, and if you're interested in buying something like this, I'll put some Amazon affiliate links below. I appreciate the, the support for that because it lets me to try out more of these types of products to see like if they are something that will be viable for you, for your home network. So until next time, I'll see you guys later.